Coming up on this edition of Out of the Blue, MTSU's new $147 million science building continues to take shape. Take a tour of the interior as explained by the Dean of MTSU's College of Basic and Applied Sciences. The camera work is the craft of MTSU journalism students. Students in public history put their handiwork on a traveling Civil War exhibit. See and hear how Rutherford County experienced the Civil War and how MTSU recognized Black History Month by honoring some unsung heroes. In this month's cover story, MTSU reopens the Baldwin Photo Gallery in brand new style with a special lecture from husband and wife photo artists who helped pioneer the age of post visualization. Plus, will both the men and women's Blue Raider basketball teams be heading to the big dance? It's March Madness with highlights of Big Blue on the hard court. Spring also ushers in baseball at Reese Smith Field. All that and more coming up on this edition of Out of the Blue. Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. We're coming to you this month from inside MTSU's new Baldwin Photo Gallery on the second floor of MTSU's Mass Communication Building. We'll have more on the gallery and the photo artists showcased in the first exhibit after the gallery's reopening. But first, construction of MTSU's new $147 million science building, both interior and exterior, continues to make strides. Two MTSU student journalists recently captured the progress for a video story in Sidelines, the MTSU student newspaper. Sidelines editor-in-chief Emily West and photo editor Kat Murphy provided this report to Out of the Blue. Since breaking ground in summer 2012, Turner Construction has been working sun up to sun down. The more than 200,000 square foot science building is well on its way to completion. By summer 2014, the university hopes that 90% will be done in order for students to use the facility by January 2015. However, the company had just the right conditions to keep the project on schedule. But the sounds of construction are far from over, even though some spaces look completely ready to use. Walking into the front of the building, you are probably wondering how will they finish in time, especially the sections without any drywall. But some of the completion will surprise you. A bulk of the office space on the first floor is in the final stages. What you also notice is that all the entrances that you come into are wide and open and have lots of light and glass. It's basically made for what would, again, soft spaces for students to do work and work together and, and meet with faculty and actually a place where you can spend the whole day. As you walk up the stairs to the second floor, you will find the biology portion of the building. Most of the stairways exit to wide and open areas. A spot where you can sit, look at that way, look at the university. To your left, you'll have offices and study rooms. To your right, you'll have class space. The new biology classrooms are twice the space of the current ones. I mean, I think it, once it's done and you have the rest of the cabinets in and you have the videos up in the back, and so you'll be able to sit here you can see the plugins. Again, you'll be able to take your laptop, plug it in, and it'll show on the big screen. You can work. So it'll all be set that way. Looking down from the second floor, you can see the entrances to lecture halls. The next floor is the most complete. The next floor, you'll be in the most finished area. As you go around the building, you get less and less finished. Sun shines from the new glass, and workers are putting on the finishing touches. The third floor is for the chemistry department with much more space new sinks and new fume hoods. The final sounds of construction are near, and soon students will fill the building instead of construction workers. Among other important features, the new science building will have the capacity to teach about 1,500 students per semester. Dean Fisher says 80% of all MTSU students will have classes in the building. Well, six MTSU aerospace graduate flight instructors didn't have to wait long in their job search. They've been hired by Atlanta-based ExpressJet. It came after all six completed an interview process with ExpressJet on campus on the same day. 
The six gentlemen who were hired are all uh, MTSU products. They came through, started, uh, I believe every one of them started, came through their private instrument, commercial, multi-engine, CFI, I, and MEI. Uh, they're uh, an example of the kind of product that we put out at MTSU here. Uh, very proud of them, uh, very proud of our program and the results of our program. Uh, for uh, ExpressJet to come here uh, for their first attempt uh, ever at a mass, should I say mass interview, if, uh, if six people is a mass interview, but they interviewed them all in one day for all six of them to get hired. I mean, that's a real uh, testimony to uh, how hard they worked, uh, how much time they put into uh, their, their uh, efforts towards their students and towards their careers, and uh, we just wish them the best of luck, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to more of our people getting hired by ExpressJet and, and other airlines. The six MTSU aerospace graduates will join ExpressJet at various times in the coming months. To learn more about MTSU's aerospace department, visit mtsu.edu slash aerospace. The latest edition of MTSU Magazine explores the university's primary role in teacher training reform, now sweeping across Tennessee. Magazine editor Drew Rubel takes an in-depth look at the many roles and variables of teaching that extend far outside the classroom. The magazine delves into how MTSU's College of Education is preparing a new generation to meet the ever-growing challenges in and outside the classroom. You can download a free copy for iPad and Android devices through an MTSU Mag app, available at iTunes and Google Play that includes extra multimedia content not available in print. It's also available online at www.mtsumagazine.com. Well, a new book telling the stories of outstanding Tennessee women has been published with the help of the MTSU Department of History. Tennessee Women of Vision and Courage includes the work of 22 authors, including MTSU's Dr. Rebecca McIntyre, Associate Professor of History, and Dr. B. Ann Cantrell, MTSU Professor Emerita. It chronicles the lives of Tennessee women who were pioneers in their fields. For more information, visit tnwomenproject.com. MTSU's public history program prepares students for careers in reaching the general reader or viewer with history, such as a recent exhibit at James E. Walker Library showcasing Rutherford County in the Civil War. The exhibit is titled, This Cruel War, Rutherford County Experiences the Civil War. Grad student Lauren Dickens talked with public history professor Dr. Brendan Martin about the exhibit and its significance. The, the story of the Civil War that we interpret on these exhibit panels is how this county experienced some of the worst travails of the entire war. I mean, this was one of the most contested areas during the, the Civil War. Uh, Long-term occupation really by both armies, uh, but more significantly by the Union Army. And we also discuss how Contrary to what many people think, that there was in fact a great deal of Union support right here in, in Rutherford County. And so we document really, well at least we attempt to document all sides of, of the story, both from a pro-Confederate, pro-Union uh, uh, perspective, as well as the perspective of, of enslaved people who witnessed the, uh, the battles and, and the war itself. The Civil War had more than its share of unsung heroes, and many of them were African Americans who fought for emancipation. The struggle for civil rights and human rights certainly has not ended. Every year during Black History Month, MTSU honors unsung heroes who achieve extraordinary things in an ordinary way. MTSU alumnus Michael McDonald gave this year's keynote address. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish arterial motives. Be kind to them anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you, but be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it still may not be enough. But give the world the best you have anyway. For you see in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. God bless you. James Butler Sr. is a longtime community volunteer, 
Pearlie May Martin devoted a 35-year career to teaching in Rutherford County, and Dr. Phyllis Hickerson Washington has helped thousands of African-American students in her leadership capacity at MTSU and the Rutherford County School District. The mission of MTSU's Confucius Institute is to enhance the understanding of Chinese language and culture and to create opportunities for exchange and collaboration between Tennessee and China. The exchange includes theatrical productions like last month's An Oriental Monsoon by Hengzhou Normal University. Well, we have a very strong partnership with this university, and this kind of performance is one of our uh, mission to uh, let the local community to understand the Chinese culture. That's one of the Confucius Institute mission. And the Confucius Institute teaches in, uh, Chinese language and also Chinese uh, uh, culture. Hengzhou Normal University and MTSU forged a partnership in 2009 to formalize outreach programs and cultural exchanges the Confucius Institute opened on the MTSU campus in 2010. MTSU's College of Mass Communication is working to increase the presence of the nationally recognized recording industry program in Southern California. Dean Ken Paulson, President Sidney A. McPhee, and recording industry chair Beverly Keel traveled to West Hollywood to meet with MTSU alumni and friends during Grammy Awards weekend. They met at the legendary Troubadour nightclub for a pre-Grammy salute and tribute. It's a legendary place and we've got a program we think that matches that and we're not being modest about this. We want to celebrate the great students, the great program and I'm so delighted Dr. McPhee gave us green light to celebrate it right here in a legendary club in the middle of L.A. I know for the three of us it's bringing two of our major loves together and all under the banner of MTSU. So it's a really special time with special people. Among other big music moments, the Troubadour is where Elton John made his U.S. debut and where James Taylor first heard Carole King's You've Got a Friend. MTSU alumni notables associated with the 56th annual Grammys include Best Country nominated Night Train, produced by Michael Knox, Casey Musgrave's Best Country album Grammy winner, Same Trailer, Different Park, co-produced by Luke Laird, and two Best Country Song nominees co-written by Jesse Alexander. They were Lee Bryce's I Drive Your Truck and Blake Shelton's Mine Would Be You. I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner. Now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. Being True Blue is working to enhance our community. My name is Kobe Sherlock and I am True Blue. At Middle Tennessee State University, we are devoted to student success. We offer the advantages of a major comprehensive university with the care and attention found at a small college. We are a community that believes in learning, growth, and service. We hold these values dear, and there's a simple phrase that conveys them. I am true blue. I am true blue. I am true blue. Being true blue is embracing unique perspectives. My name is Iris Montes, and I am true blue.
Just down the road from Music City, Middle Tennessee State University's Department of Recording Industry is putting students on course for exciting careers in the music business. Whether they want to work behind the scenes or behind the mic, MTSU graduates have gone on to perform on the world's biggest stages and have found remarkable jobs with some of the industry's most respected labels and entertainment companies. This is just one community among many. Explore all that MTSU has to offer. Devoted to student success, Middle Tennessee State University. With that, Professor Emeritus Harold Baldwin officially reopened MTSU's Baldwin Photographic Gallery in its new home on campus on the second floor of the College of Mass Communication building. The gallery's reopening showcases the exhibit of photographic artists Jerry Yulesman and Maggie Taylor, a husband-wife team known for work that stretches the boundaries of traditional photography. Gallery curator and MTSU professor Tom Jemison introduced the artist for a special lecture and the man for whom the gallery is named. In the early 1960s, Mr. Baldwin began to teach photography. It was in the industrial arts building. Soon after, he began to show work of the different exhibiting photographers. And eventually, it became known as the photo gallery. He also began to collect work of the people that were exhibiting here at MTSU, which is now the permanent archive. In 1964, um, he began exhibiting outside artists and continued through uh, 1991. We didn't think we would ever get a gallery back, but Mr. Baldwin stepped forward with a substantial gift from Gainesville, Florida. I give you Jerry Yulesman and Maggie Taylor. And what we've brought is a selection of images um, sort of spanning both of our careers. Jerry's from 1959 or so will be the earliest image that he'll show up until a few weeks ago and mine from 1985 or so until now. I began exploring options of multiple exposures at the camera. This is called Bless Our Home and Eagle. It was done in 1962. I was really interested in establishing sort of foreground, background relationships that I thought could be meaningful and interesting. But post-visualization was essentially an appeal for photographers to allow for the same kind of in-process discovery that occurs in all other areas of art. The title of this is Small Woods Where I Met Myself. Just this past year, I did this image, which I called Transparent Self, but you can see that allusion to the complexity of actually, we are interesting creatures, we are complex creatures. Actually, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had a large exhibit a year and a half, two years ago, called Faking It, that shows that manipulation existed throughout the entire history of photography. If you see a 19th century photograph in which clouds occur, that is a combination print because the materials were so excessively blue sensitive, any landscape photograph would have a white sky, a second exposure on another piece of film would be required to obtain those clouds. People kept asking me if I was interested in Alice in Wonderland, and this would have been back in um, 2005 and 2006, and I kept saying no, no, not really, I'm not, I don't really recall anything except the Disney movie. I don't really remember as a child anything much about the Alice story. So I went back and read it and decided I would make a project for myself to illustrate the, the first 12 chapters of Alice in Wonderland. So I ended up spending three years and doing 45 images to be all of the different scenes and characters for Alice. And this came out in 2008. And I just really loved this girl. I thought she, this sort of something about the photographs from the 19th century and how they represent this one moment in time where people really had a different sort of respect for photography and it was so special for them to have one portrait made maybe in their lifetime, one or two portraits made for some people and that was it, as opposed to now where we go around with our cell phones and snap pictures every 10 minutes or something. This is called <laughs> Burden of Dreams and it's 
one that I made last year, and then I realized I wanted it to have a partner image, so I made a woman that goes with him. And it was kind of taking everything out of my drawer and scanning it all in, all the little objects that I love, some of which I've used before and some of which I had never used before, and just putting them all in as if they're ideas coming out of these people's heads. And one of the things that interested me in art history, as you go from the 19th to the 20th century, and this is sort of a simplification, but you basically go from what was essentially outer-directed art to inner-directed art, art that fulfilled the needs of the patron, of the church, you know, of the culture, society, to art that was then much more personal, much more self-expressive. And I find myself to be very much a part of that tradition. So he, you know, first he tried faces on the bed and a little character in the television set, and this is actually a hotel room in Korea in the background where he just put his glasses on the pillow and photographed the hotel room. So everything else is kind of added in. But then he decided the name of it would be The Burden of Dreams yes. for him. So they look kind of interesting to me, and yet they didn't have all the photographic detail in their faces that I would want. So I thought, I've got to make them have masks, but then I want them to have a big stack of books. So as I gradually worked on it, it becomes kind of like a stage set, and these are characters that come in and play out this little drama. I took some books outside, just books that I like in our collection, and photographed them and started working on the people's clothing and then decided they should have little magnifying glasses as if they're really ready to read or examine something. So in the end, it's called the book club. This photograph is called Journey in the Night. And I do have a new book. All books are printed in China. And so what happens once they're done, they FedEx you one book. So I have one copy of this book. But the others come in six weeks. And it'll be on Amazon. And if you the, want to change it, get your thing back no, here. No, wait. I want to promote my book. Okay, nobody. <laughs> no. No, never mind. Remote never control. Mind. Truly become our way of relating to the world and to ourselves. Thank you. The Yulesman Taylor exhibit will be on display through March 9th, and then a new exhibit, Images of Country. Three photographers on country music through the decades will be on display after spring break. The Baldwin Gallery is open daily during regular business hours. Being True Blue is giving your all on and off the court. My name is Ebony Rowe and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is embracing unique perspectives. My name is Iris Montes and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is helping students solve real world problems. My name is Cliff Ricketts and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is making the world a safer place. My name is Sam Willie, and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is helping others to reach their potential. My name is Daryl Freeman, and I am True Blue. Science shapes our society. The products, technologies, and efforts of the sciences affect much of our everyday lives. And the more advances we make, the more the careers of tomorrow will rely on a strong education in the basic and applied sciences. At MTSU, you will learn from Tennessee's best faculty, along with hands-on training with the latest equipment and facilities. Come and learn the science of success. Being True Blue is doing more than once expected. My name is Ben Jones, and I am True Blue. MT Baseball will honor former coach John Stanford and Ree Smith Jr., the man whose name graces Ree Smith Field, with life-size statues. Both were instrumental in the growth of MT Baseball, and their likenesses will stand in front of the stadium. 
The announcement was made at the 41st annual Groundhog Day Luncheon at Murphy Center. Right where the flagpoles are at now, the flagpoles will be moved, the large flagpole in the center will stay, and Coach Stanford will be on one side and Mr. Smith will be on the other side. But they will both be located right outside of the stadium, light shining on them, it'll be a focal point of that, not just of the stadium, but really that side of campus. Lady Raider basketball standout Ebony Rowe is in the record books as MTSU's all-time leading scorer, breaking a 27-year mark held by former Smyrna great Kim Webb. Rowe broke the record when she scored 17 points in the win over Old Dominion, surpassing the 2,148 mark previously set by Webb. Averaging 21.5 points and 11.7 rebounds per game, Rowe is now the leading scorer and the leading rebounder of all time for MTSU. She has earned Women's Basketball Player of the Week honors six times this season from the Tennessee Sports Writers Association and Conference USA Player of the Week four times. When I tell you it was an unbelievable moment, and I'm sure you all saw my face, that was <laughs> my real emotion. Just the crowd was so amazing, and they wanted it so bad for me. And that's why I really almost cried, and I know it sounds so corny, but um, just a great atmosphere, and I wouldn't want to do this anywhere else but here. For the second consecutive year, Roe has been named to the Naismith Women's Player of the Year Top 30 watch list with more than 20 double-doubles this season. Rowe has also been named to the Capital One Academic All-American second team. As of late February, she has helped lead the Lady Raiders to a record of 23-4, 12-1 in Conference USA, with just three games remaining on the date of this recording. The Lady Raiders were on top of Conference USA and looking for a school record sixth consecutive regular season title. Senior Blue Raider Sean Jones earned his second Conference USA Player of the Week honor in February. The honor came after a week in which Jones recorded back-to-back double-doubles. Jones scored 22 points and pulled down 11 rebounds against Eastern Carolina, then 20 points and 10 rebounds against Old Dominion. They were the 7th and 8th double-double of the season for Jones and the 11th and 12th of his career. He's since earned his 9th double-double. The earlier performances helped MT to post wins over East Carolina and over Old Dominion. MT extended its winning streak to nine games with wins over FIU, Tulane, and Southern Mississippi in the Murphy Center and Charlotte and Marshall on the road. In the win over FIU, Jones tallied his 1,000th career point off a dunk in the first half. He is just the third player in MT history to amass 1,000 points, 500 rebounds, and 100 blocks in his career. Jones went on to score 23 points. Well, the Lady Raiders basketball team helped raise awareness and financial support for cancer research by playing in the 4K Power of Pink game at the Murphy Center on February 8th. The Lady Raiders wore pink uniforms in their 65-54 defeat of Rice. Fans were urged to wear pink to celebrate those who have survived and to those who have lost their battle with cancer. Cancer survivors like MTSU's own Gloria Bonner were honored at the game. And I am hopeful at some point in my lifetime or in the lifetime of the generations to come that we can find that gene that will eradicate the cancer. And thank you so much, Coach Enzel, and also Coach Turnham for giving us the opportunity in the community to celebrate their survivorship here. After the game, the Lady Raiders auctioned off all 15 of the exclusive game-worn pink uniforms with the proceeds split between the K. Yow Cancer Fund and St. Thomas Rutherford Foundation's Power of Pink Fund. Well, that's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. Until next time, stay true blue.